So my name is Paul Crow. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Humanities and currently the chair of the Department of Humanities. And uh, I would like to commence this evening's program by uh, making an acknowledgement that we, we always do at SFU. Um, SFU acknowledges the Squamish, Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh, Katsi, and Coquitlam peoples on whose traditional territories our three campuses stand. We recognize that their traditional lands were taken and their languages and cultures were displaced by colonial powers. We further recognize the ongoing need to support dialogue in, in the interests of building a relationship of mutual respect. I'd like next to acknowledge a group of sponsors who made this evening's event possible. So the Department of Humanities first, uh, was uh, the main organizer. We had great support from our Institute of Humanities as well. And the David Lamb Center made a contribution to the evening as well, as did Indian Summer. We're very thankful for, uh, to Indian Summer to, for bringing a community, community aspect to what we're doing this evening and, and showing your support. I'd also like to just say very quickly uh, a note of thanks to Dr. Christina Cerverius and also to Doris Tai and the David Lamb Center for their help in uh, supporting the logistics and organization for this evening. So uh, this evening we're, we're delighted to, I'm just gonna advance to the first slide here, we're delighted to be um, celebrating the launch of a new publication, Conversations with Ambedkar. And uh, this of course is edited by our visiting scholar, Professor Valerian Rodriguez. And, uh, oh, welcome, come on in, yes. All right. So um, I'd also like to say that Dr. Rodriguez's visit to SFU, he's actually teaching in the Department of Humanities for one semester. He returns to India at the end of April. And we've been, uh, he's been very gracious about giving talks, uh, sharing his research with us, and has been a wonderful colleague in the department over the past many weeks. So we're, we're thrilled to have him here. The visit to the Department of Humanities is made possible by the Hari Madhu Varshini Visiting Scholars Program in Indian Studies, which supports work with the Indian Council for Cultural Relations in bringing world-class scholars from India to Canada to share their research. So it's those two bodies that have made it possible for uh, Dr. Rodriguez to be here, not only this evening, but for the entire semester. I'd like to say just a few words about our distinguished speaker this evening. Uh, Professor Rodriguez is a, a, a political scientist who's focused his research on the writings of Baba Saheb Ambedkar. He has made substantial contributions to the debate on the workings of Indian parliament, constitutionalism in India, and also agrarian politics in India. He taught in the Department of Political Science at Mangalore University and was subsequently professor in the, sorry, the Center for Political Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU. He went on to become the first Ambedkar Chair at the Ambedkar University, Delhi, and has been ICCR uh, visiting professor at the University of Erfurt, visiting professor at the University of Würzburg, and fellow at the Max Weber Center for Advanced Studies, all in Germany. He received his PhD from the Center for Political Studies at JNU in India in 1986 and was Agatha Harrison Fellow at St. Anthony's College, Oxford from 1989 to 1991. He was also Senior Fellow at the Indian Institute for Advanced Studies from 1999 to 2001. He is also National Fellow for the Indian Council for Social Science Research, ICSSR. This evening, what we're going to do is, well, we'll have a brief introduction to the, to the publication, and then we're going to have a conversation, or listen to a conversation, and I hope you will all join in afterwards for a Q&A um, to uh, interact with uh, um, Professor Rodriguez and also my colleague, Professor, uh, Associate Professor Samir Gandesha. Maybe I should say a few words about my colleague. I think I will. He's been busy. He's been running, literally running around the planet. If anybody's on Facebook, will know. Um, actually, I, I, poor Samir, I trouble him. I, I'm sure he actually can Facebook from the shower. <laughs> he's he's a, a brilliant at social media, but he has a lot to share, and we're very proud of the work he's done uh, and is doing. He's currently on 
well, on leave, technically, you shouldn't, <laughs> but we're, we're really glad he's come in this evening to, for this conversation. Um, Samir has been the uh, Liu Boming Visiting Professor of, uh, in Philosophy at the University of Nanjing, a, a fine university and visiting lecturer at Suzhou University of Science and Tech in China. In February 2019, he taught a course on the neoliberal personality at the University of Sao Paulo and is a visiting faculty member at the Paris Institute for Critical Thinking. There's a lot more I could say, but I'll leave it at that. Um, and of course, he is, when he's not on leave, the director of the Institute for Humanities. And he's done tremendous work building up that institute, which is the principal outreach arm, actually one of the principal outreach arms of SFU, um, and certainly of our department, and has been for decades. So he's done a, a considerable work there, um, and we're thankful for that. And we're grateful that the two of you are here to share your thoughts on this publication and some of the wider issues it addresses. And with that, I will uh, step aside. Thank you, Paul, for um, this wonderful, um, a little exaggerated uh, introduction. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited that uh, Professor Samir Gandesha is here to chair this particular uh, discussion, this conversation. Uh, we have brought out recently a book called uh, Conversations with Ambedkar, 10 Ambedkar Memorial Lectures. This book has been published by my former employer, Ambedkar University, Delhi, where I held a chair for, uh, for about a year, uh, and Tulika Press. And the book is going to be shortly brought out by Columbia University Press, New York. Uh, they have already advertised it uh, uh, in, their, uh, in their advertisements and uh, the expected date of the book from Columbia University, New York, is uh, in July 9, 2019. Uh, unfortunately, the book is not in hand. The books have been posted from India, but unfortunately, books have not reached uh, to us as yet. Um, what I am going to do is... Um, uh, situate these particular lectures in terms of a book and uh, uh, play out a little my own role in terms of uh, introducing this book and why I introduce Ambedkar the way I introduce and how do I bring these lectures. So there are two parts to my initial presentation. Uh, my way of looking at Ambedkar in terms of these 10 lectures, and then I would give you a few slides enumerating the high points of these lectures and who are these people. Partly because the people themselves are very important, they are, I've brought in a certain amount of introduction to these uh, people. These uh, 10 lectures were presented at the Ambedkar University, Delhi, from 2009 to 2018. Uh, I completed my editorial work somewhere in July 2018, and the book is just out of the press. Uh, I had a little problem with regard to putting together these, these lectures, because these lectures were delivered on the 14th of uh, April, every year, from 2009 onwards. And they were given by independent scholars. These lectures did not address directly any issue that Ambedkar was talking about. But somewhere, sometimes directly, but very often indirectly, their lectures touched upon some of the central concerns of Baba Sahib Ambedkar. 
So my big challenge was how do I put together these relatively independent lectures in terms of a book and I picked up a theme called Ambedkar as a scholar and Ambedkar scholarship today. And using that theme as a writer, I brought together these 10 lectures and to show how when a serious academic begin to talk about the central concerns of his discipline or the central concerns that we face today in terms of the broader domains of our society, he also to some extent connects itself to Ambedkar because Ambedkar as a scholar was talking to these particular concerns. The second thing that I have done is to map out Ambedkarite scholarship in the last three decades. And uh, I have mapped them up in terms of themes, bringing, as far as I know, all the major writings on Ambedkar that have come up in the last 30 years. And I would introduce them to you shortly. First, let me come to, come to this particular aspect, that is Ambedkar as a scholar, and uh, later on I would give you a brief about Ambedkar scholarship today. Uh, if you look at the writings of uh, Dalits in India, Dalits is a term which may not be known to some of you, Dalit is a term we today generally use to denote the members of the former untouchable communities as well as those who would like to strongly associate themselves with these communities. I'm giving a slightly expansive uh, kind of a map. So those who are included within the traditional untouchable communities as well as those who agree to the perspectives and visions of Baba Sahib Ambedkar and Dalit movement in India. Uh, generally, Dalit scholarship in India has projected uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar as a scholarly person who had studied in several universities because this gives them a certain recognition that if Baba Sahib Ambedkar or Dr. Ambedkar, if he has achieved such excellent scholarship, Dalits who have been reviled and despised generally in, within the traditions of India, they too can achieve similar kind of hikes. So you find a great deal of focus on Ambedkar's studies at Columbia University where he did his PhD, at the London School of Economics where he did a doctor in science degree in economics and his uh, legal uh, qualifications. Now for me these are important but not so much as this popular literature throws up, in the book I begin to argue that we need to see what is it that is driving Baba Sahib Ambedkar's scholarship and in what respect we consider him as an academic icon. My argument here is, um, is the way he inserted himself into the scholarship at uh, Columbia University, as well as at the London School of Economics. Um, you know, what kind of a scholarship does he insert himself into? Uh, those of you who are familiar with uh, the rise of uh, social sciences would know that in the early part of the 20th century, when Ambedkar was a student at Columbia University, Social sciences were crafting themselves as autonomous disciplines. And the person who was the guide of uh, Dr. Ambedkar for PhD at Columbia University, Edwin Seligman, 
was uh, the founder president of the Economic Association of United States. He was the first editor, or he was the chief editor of the Encyclopedia of Social Sciences when it was brought out. And he was the economic advisor to the president of United States uh, twice. Now, these backgrounds of uh, the advisor may not be very important, but if you look at Ambedkar's journey, they seem to be very important because Ambedkar saw his scholarship as something which is directed in terms of public policies and interventions, and not merely to be an armchair scholar. This is particularly true with regard to the teacher whose three courses that he studied, but continued to, continued to call him as his teacher. Uh, that is John Dewey, you know, the renowned philosopher uh, of United States, and generally those of us who study the philosophical traditions of pragmatism would know that John Dewey is probably its most illustrious star. Now, Ambedkar read a large number of books that John Dewey produced. Generally in the literature, there is a focus on the book, Democracy and Education, but in recent years, we know that Ambedkar very often contacted his students or his admirers in New York or in London to get him a writing, and sometimes not so well-known writing of John Dewey, because he was following John Dewey, not merely in terms of the kind of positions that Dewey was embracing with regard to democracy, religion, etc., but also with regard to the philosophical traditions of trends of thinking of, of uh, John Dewey. And um, I have suggested in this work that John Dewey's influence remains quite central to Ambedkar. And later on, when Ambedkar takes his diksha or embraces Buddhism, the kind of Buddhism that he constructs is in a way walking into Buddhism rather than a kind of uh, qualitative transition that we normally associate with conversion. So this is, these are some of the things that I explore with regard to Columbia University, and I begin to argue that the stamp of Columbia University is very strongly present in Ambedkar's writings and political practices, both in an epistemic sense, in a methodological sense, and in terms of his political orientations. Ambedkar did not want to go to Oxford and Cambridge because the alumni of Oxford and Cambridge were ruling India. And uh, Sidney Webbs and Beatrice Webbs had published two important studies, one on trade unions and the other one on cooperatives. And uh, eventually these books or these, uh, their studies were to form the backbone of the setting up of London School of Economics in 1899. Ambedkar attended practically all the lectures that were given by Sidney Webbs. Ambedkar also had studied very closely the work of T.H. Green, the famous liberal idealist philosopher, whose ideas also were to become significant in the constitution of London School of Economics. And then Ambedkar becomes a lawyer. So I work out what kind of ideas that he takes overboard. 
And let's all remember that the party that Ambedkar founded in 1937 took, took on its mask the slogan of the Fabians, educate, organize, agitate. So here is a person who is exposed to one of the best cosmopolitan debates and discussions and an activist posture and very, with very strong moral grounding of the responsibility of the scholar. Those of you who are familiar with John Dewey's works would know that, you know, people like Sidney Hook, his student, sometimes thought that John Dewey was a Marxist. Sidney Hook himself was a Marxist, while John Dewey all the time denied that he was a Marxist. And John Dewey also argued that there is no future for Marxism in the United States. But Dewey himself set up a fairly radical political program against President Roosevelt in 19, 19, late 1920s and 30s. And with people like Du Bois, the great black thinker and leader, formed the party. For Ambedkar, this was to become a precedent. So let me conclude here. The book begins to argue that Ambedkar developed himself as a scholar of a very distinct type probably getting himself attuned to the best of the scholarship that the 20, early 20th century could provide. He was familiar with the debates that were going on in India. He had studied Parsi when he was in Elphinstone College. He came from a deeply religious family. His father used to sing continuously hymns from Kabir, and Ramji Sakbal had very consciously embraced Kabir Pant, while his grandfather was a Ramanandi. And his grandfather persuaded Ambedkar's father to become a Ramanandi, but he refused. So you have a very complex kind of Indian traditions getting you know, critically exposed to the kind of scholarship that he had. And uh, Ambedkar intervenes into the political life, the intellectual life of India in a very significant way and writes extensively. Um, the second part, that is uh, Ambedkar scholarship. Uh, um, I might have to look into my pages uh, just to give you a feel about what is the kind of scholarship that we have on Ambedkar. Um, in an earlier study that I did, uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2002, called Ambedkar Essential Writings, uh, I, I, I have actually traced Ambedkar scholarship up to the 1990s. Uh, if you look at the 80s as a benchmark, there was very little Ambedkar scholarship that is available to us. And whatever is available comes from Dalit scholars. But there is very little that non-Dalit scholars produce till the 1980s. So Ambedkar as a memory, as an intellectual memory, remained in India largely confined to Dalits till the 1980s. But in the last three decades, there has been a flowering of Ambedkar scholarship, both in India as well as abroad. And I would give you a little feel about that scholarship now. But it is not merely academic scholarship around which 
you know, which has taken off from Ambedkar, but also cultural reproductions, films, uh, artists, songs, folklore, um, and uh, you have a kind of, suppose I use this big word, you have a new kind of a social imaginary that is set up around uh, Dr. Ambedkar. Uh, let me give you a little brief about the different uh, domains around which this scholarship has flourished. 1979, we have the first volume that was published, Ambedkar's, uh, right, uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar, Writings and Speeches by the government of Maharashtra because these writings were not available and quite a few of these writings were caught up in legal suits. So Maharashtra government took over the, the copyright on Ambedkar's writings and the first volume was published in 1979. And up to now we have 22 volumes that have been published, some of them in two parts, like the Hindu Code Bill uh, uh, a couple of volumes deal with his Marathi writings, but 17 volumes are primarily concerned about his works. And some of them are big works, uh, like his two uh, doctoral di dissertations, uh, the, the book that he published on, on Pakistan or partition of India, uh, a classic work on the caste system called Annihilation of Caste. His own thesis about India's national movement called What Congress and Gandhi Have Done to the Untouchables. A book on the Shudras in 1946. A book on the Untouchables in 1948. And a major work on Buddhism in 1956, when he died, uh, but the book was published in 1957, together with several other writings that uh, span across an extremely creative period of, uh, of about 40 years of writings alongside political practice. Let me come to the last 30 years and give you a quick idea about what are the various domains around which this scholarship has flourished. And maybe drop a couple of names who have done this work. The first type of work has been done by people who have reflected upon Ambedkar's ideas and thought. And uh, uh, there are several people who have done this work, I, I myself, I consider myself working primarily in this area. Um, there has been the work of Professor Gopal Guru. There has been uh, a recently a uh, publication from Stanford University by Aishwarya Kumar. And there are movies revolving, for refocusing on Ambedkar's agenda. Uh, movies likes and some of these movies, I'm sure you have seen Jabbar Patel's Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar in 2000 in English, Shashi Khan Nalavade's Yuk Purush Dr. Baba Sahib Ambedkar in 1993 in Marathi, Sharan Kumar Kabur's Dr. B.R. Ambedkar in Kannada, Subodh Nagdev's Bole India Jai Bhim in Marathi, etc which actually draw upon Ambedkar's writings. Then you have the Dalit movement and Dalit movement's linkages with Dr. Ambedkar. Now, Dalit movement in India is extremely complex. Uh, Dalits in India are divided across linguistic communities, across castes, and sometimes across ethnic groups. But across this, these cleavages, ethnic cleavages, there is one, one person who enjoys universal respect and aplomb is Dr. Ambedkar. And 
the great Dalit poet Namdev Dasal gave expression to this by saying that there is nothing to look beyond, but there is only one person to whom we can still look up to, that is uh, uh, Dr. Ambedkar. So in a sense, Ambedkar evokes admiration, respect, and seen as an exemplar by Dalits across India, but not in a uniform sense, because there are local loyalties playing around, and, uh, and therefore there are all kinds of competitions and cleavages that come to be worked out. Uh, now, uh, you can see this not merely in writings. Uh, one of the person who has done excellent work is uh, a Columbia University academic called Anupama Rao on this. Uh, uh, the title of the book is Cast in Question, you know, where she actually begins to work out uh, the movement, Dalit movement in India. But there are also movies like Anand Patuvardhan's Jai Beam Comrade which focuses on the shooting that took place in Mumbai when 13 people were shot dead from a slum quarters. Uh, and uh, it's a very powerful movie, and I'm sure that some of you have seen this. In recent years, uh, there have been extensive uh, works on Dalit movement in India, and uh, there are also works highlighting cleavages within Dalit movement. But very often we tend to focus on literature that is available in English. What has happened is flourishing of literature related to Ambedkar, related to the Dalit movement in regional languages. And probably this regional theater reflecting on Ambedkar and his connectivity to Dalit movement is much richer today compared to any time in the past. Here also there is a certain amount of unevenness. There is a very strong impact of this kind of literature in, uh, in uh, Marathi, in uh, Kannada, in Tamil, in Telugu, Bengal is just catching up, and Punjab picked up momentum on, in this direction in 1970s. So there is a certain amount of unevenness with regard to this. There has been a lot of work with regard to the philosophical and methodological uh, frames that Ambedkar employed, and I would suggest in this context the work of people like Gopal Guru and Sundar Sarukai, the work of um, people like Meera Nanda, who is teaching in the New York, um, um, New York State University, and several others. Uh, uh, recently, the work of Cosimo Zene, uh, who is professor at SWAS in uh, London, comparing the work of uh, Ambedkar with that of uh, Antonio Gramsci, the Italian philosopher uh, uh, and Marxist. The big battle of Dalits in India is the battle to restore their humanity. And this word, restore, restoration of their humanity, is a term that Ambedkar uses. Now, what is this restoration from? This is restoration from what Ambedkar generally tends to describe using three adjectives, uh, generally prevalent across Indian languages, niche, achut, and bhaiskrit. Niche means low, achut means polluting, and uh, bhaiskrit means socially excluded. He also uses other adjectives but generally you come across these three adjectives. So Ambedkar very often uses the term, there is a human, there, there is a whole humanity here which is treated as 
subhuman. So there is therefore there is a boundary line that is drawn. Therefore, a Dalit lives a life, a broken life. He can he claims himself as a human, but he is continuously denied his humanity. The term Dalit today denotes this broken personality which is striving to reconstitute himself or herself as a wholesome person. Ambedkar himself does not use this term very often. He uses it only three or four times in his Marathi writings, but Dalits in India have gone wholesale to embrace this particular term. But as you know, the term connotes lowliness, the term connotes rebellion, and there are Dalits today who do not like to describe themselves as fighting, they do not like to describe themselves as polluting, and therefore they call themselves as Ambedkarites. And therefore, there is a cleavage that has emerged between Ambedkarites on one hand and Dalits on the other in terms of usage of the term. And I have discussed some literature that uh, dwells on this. Ambedkar is by far one of the most important scholars we have in terms of marking out caste, caste system, and how it reproduces itself over time. Uh, Ambedkar also begins to argue how that system can be taken headlong and alternatives can be proposed. Now, for some time, particularly under Nehruian inspiration, caste was not something which was studied by people very closely unless they had direct academic interest in that particular domain. But if you look at the last 30 years, suddenly caste has come back to scholarship. And I could just point out to you several works that have come up. Charu Gupta's, I have already mentioned to you Anupama Rao's work, the work of Ganguly, the work of Chires Garza and others. In my discipline, in the last 50 years, the central idea that has gripped scholarship in political philosophy is the idea of social justice. Um, we normally trace this particular development after, the, after this classic work of John Rawls, published in 1970 called Theory of Justice. And subsequently, there is a flourishing of literature on social justice. Now, if you look at, I'm, I'm not trying to collapse one into the other, but Ambedkar is one of the person who is experiencing social reality in India and begin to say that equality of rights, pure and simple, cannot be the future of the people that I, I earlier described. You need to have something much more. And therefore, Ambedkar begins to factor in disadvantage as a central principle with equality of rights. And uh, just as a sort of, a, sort of a, uh, diversion, a friend of mine went to see John Rawls a few years ago, and he was a great Gandhian scholar, and he took a bag full of things to ask from the Gandhian literature to John Rawls. And after talking a while, Rawls said, what is happening to the policy of reservation in India? And the policy of reservation in India was crafted by Baba Sahib Ambedkar. He gave justification to it, and he provided the constitutional status to it. There has been a huge amount of work in recent years on 
constitutionalism and rights. Uh, now, again, Indian judiciary, like judiciary is probably elsewhere, always thought themselves as conservative bodies, relatively conservative bodies. But from 1980s onwards, judiciary in India was pushed to talking about rights. And quotations from Ambedkar's work and justification for from Ambedkar's writings has become almost universal within the judiciary. And there is a scholarship that has come up of enormous proportions discussing Ambedkar and constitutionalism. And I could just suggest to you names like Professor Mark Gallanter, the work of Upendra Bakshi, the work of Mendelssohn and Bakshi, the work of recent work of Pratap Banu Mehta, the work of Andre Bete, the sociologist, and others who are reflecting on constitutionalism and the legal regime that Baba Sahib Ambedkar crafted and how that, that idea of constitutionalism distinguishes itself from the ideas of constitutionalism that came to be preeminent in the European theater. You know, can, can a post-colony speak in the language of constitutionalism? You know, this is the important question that is being. Ambedkar was very strongly in favor of gender rights. Uh, if you look at the Hindu code bill, which he did not succeed, and he did resigned from the cabinet on that ground, you can see that Ambedkar is marshalling arguments for inheritance rights for women, for for consultation with wives with regard to you know, uh, inheritance, with regard to uh, uh, adopting children, and with regard to division of property. Ambedkar very strongly argues for monogamy as a universal principle. Now, naturally, these practices were varied in India, and some of the people did not like Ambedkar intervening into orthodoxy, and eventually he had to resign. So Ambedkar's intervention with regard to certain aspects of law, particularly personal law, is signally important, and he carries his idea of constitutionalism in terms of revamping personal relations across genders. And, um, and of course, I personally think that Ambedkar is probably the, the scholar par excellence that we have on the idea of democracy. Ambedkar begins to defend the idea of constitutional democracy alongside what he calls democracy as our collective futures. That democracy is something that humanity would choose to select, to define itself, partly because he did not subscribe, as I have suggested earlier, in a transcendental principle to which we owe our futures. So our futures are going to be collectively going to be decided. And he quotes John Dewey extensively when he begins to talk about significance of democracy which even goes against constitutional democracy in terms of defining our futures. Um, one, of the, one, of the, one of the areas where there has been a huge controversy in recent years in India is with regard to Gandhi and Ambedkar and their mutual relationships. Um, there are very bright minds that have written, and one of the person who whose work is very important in this context is the work of Arundhati Roy and the rejoinder to Arundhati Roy from Gandhi's grandson, um, um, Ramchandra Gandhi, you know, and uh, the debate between them. 
Uh, there are two, two other areas that I just want to touch up. Um, that is, uh, Ambedkar thinks positively about the state. Uh, Ambedkar thinks that it is possible for the state to become benign to the extent that state becomes controlled by democracy. A state power begins to be controlled by democracy. Uh, but there has been little work so far with regard to Ambedkar's idea of the state. And uh, let's all remember that uh, the work on the state has flourished in the West, particularly after Carl Smith's work on the idea of the political. And we have a lot to do by taking off from Ambedkar with regard to a very different notion of the state that he inherits from London School of Economics and from Fabian Socialism of London School of Economics. A lot of scholarship, particularly anthropologists, have gone very much to look into Ambedkar's conversion to Buddhism. You know? uh, and there is, there is, uh, there is, a lo there is, there is probably the theme requires it. But there is no corresponding uh, interest with regard to Ambedkar's idea of Buddhism, sorry, Hinduism, his critique of Hinduism. And probably it was required because that's something which led him to a particular kind of Buddhism, to construct Buddhism in a particular fashion. Okay, that's, that's what I do, you know. I have tried to construct Ambedkar as a scholar, and I have given an idea about what is the kind of scholarship that we have on Ambedkar, and then I try to connect these lectures to Ambedkar as a scholar and Ambedkar, Ambedkar scholarship today so that the book reads as a wholesome entity rather than of 10, 10 fragments which are bound together in, uh, in a, you know, you know, together in a volume. So I have, you, have, you will have a little brief now on uh, this, this, uh, this title, <coughs> Conversations with Ambedkar. I, I initially worked out four or five titles, but eventually I squared around this, Conversations with Ambedkar, because we are, we are talking to Ambedkar today, you know, both as a scholar and in terms of scholarship that exists today. Can we go to the next? Yeah. yeah. This man is, uh, was 10 years vice chancellor of uh, uh, Ambedkar University, Delhi, Sham Menon. Uh, and um, he is the one who has promoted these lectures. And he thinks that Ambedkar scholarship, his writings, and including his daredevilry, should become part of the future of academics, you know, that students should learn to question and question the questions, he says, if we want to build up a future. And he begins to see Ambedkar in that particular fashion. So he, he does this forward to this work. Yeah. Next one. Uh, of course, this one is not required. Yeah, I will read this <laughs> yeah. Next one, next one, yeah. Uh, you, you must have heard about Professor Bhikkhu Pareg, a member of the House of Lords. Um, he gave the first lecture on Ambedkar's legacy. Uh, it's a very powerful lecture because uh, Professor Bhikkhu Pareg uh, is an extremely well-known political philosopher, uh, has a great deal of standing. He was the chairman of, uh, multi of the Commission for Multicultural Britain. And he begins to argue in this that there are four ideas which are central to Ambedkar's legacy. That is his idea of democracy, his uh, exploration of the problem of untouchability, his conception of nationalism, and his approach to Buddhism. He also makes three important criticisms against uh, Ambedkar. 
He thinks that Baba Sahib Ambedkar was too much of a statist and believed in institutional approaches. He had an elitist bias. And uh, yeah, these, uh, these important things, which I, you know, I have critiqued this in my long discussion on these papers. Because I, I don't think I would go with the way Professor Parekh pitches the criticisms against Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Uh, you can read the book and uh, see my small note on uh, Professor Bhikkhu Parekh's this lecture. But otherwise, a person of his stature giving the first lecture was very important for the university uh, because it immediately gave a kind of standing to these memorial lectures. Um, next one. Uh, Professor Vinandas and the big introduction there about she's professor at John Hopkins, one of the most important anthropologists in the world today. And she builds up this very interesting argument in this paper, citizenship as a claim of stories of dwelling and belonging among the urban poor. Uh, the central argument she makes is how the poor in India begins to tweak law by appealing to the other side of law to legitimize their own small holdings. Otherwise, they would be thrown out from their holdings. She uses the concept of apadharma from the Indian traditions, how law has an underside called apadharma, and that underside is thrown up before the courts, before the state apparatuses to have their small holdings intact. In a way, this is a critique of Baba Sahib Ambedkar, but I don't see it as a very strong critique because Ambedkar argued that eventually the sight which would make the difference is power. She argues that agency, human agency at work of the poor can make significant differences. Ambedkar has an argument there, but for the time being, I would skip that. Yeah, next one. The third one is Professor Deepak Nayar, my old colleague in JNU, uh, an extremely illustrious person. Um, and um, he, was, uh, he was the advisor, economic advisor to government of India. And he was um, deputy chairman of UNDP. Oh, sorry, he was deputy chairman of uh, one of these United Nations bodies, and written extensively, and he discusses the idea of social justice in Ambedkar, comparing not so much Ambedkar, idea of social justice in India, and comparing the outcome of these ideas with that of affirmative action policies in the United States and South Africa. Next one. Uh, Ashish Nandi, uh, Professor Ashish Nandi is, um, is uh, one of uh, the extremely well-known social theorists of India who, who argues that, uh, that uh, solutions to our problems cannot come from science or from modernity, uh, including from the radical side of it because they eventually speak the same language. So the alternative lies in terms of getting into dialogues with people who are situated in, uh, in, in disadvantageous positions. So, so what we need is an alternative to modern science, modern social sciences, and critical discourses. His position would probably go against Baba Sahib Ambedkar, but not necessarily so. For the time being, I would not like to explore that area. But I've been a little critical about this paper in my introduction. Yeah, next one. Uh, Upendra Bakshi is, um, is one, probably the most important uh, uh, law professor in India. 
um, and uh, has taken a great deal of interest on uh, Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Uh, and it's, it's, this is a very moving paper, you know, where he, begin to, he begins to, in a sense, challenge law itself. Why law is not able to reach out to the poor? Next one. Um, Gopal Krishna Gandhi um, is, um, is uh, coming from the higher echelons of administration in India, was um, advisor to the president of India a couple of times, was the governor of the most troublesome state in India called West Bengal, and um, he is also the grandson of uh, Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, uh, he, in this paper, he begins to applaud the great leadership thrown up by Baba Sahib Ambedkar. Yeah, next one. Uh, Aruna Roy, Dr. Aruna Roy, is the founder of a very important uh, working class organization called Mazdur Kisan Shakti Sangatan. She is also the recipient of the Magsasi Award. And, uh, and uh, she, recently she has brought out a book. This book she brought out after she gave this particular lecture. So this book is, in a sense, an elaboration of the paper that is included in this volume. Um, the RTI story, Power to the People. Yeah, next one. Um, Romila Tapper is uh, the acclaimed historian of modern India. Um, she, was, she was my senior colleague at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Um, now, what she does here is quite important. That is, rethinking the concept of civilization. She begins to argue that the concept of civilization as it was incorporated within historical studies in India was primarily a derivative concept. And if it has to be tenable today, that concept needs to speak to other dimensions. It needs to speak to the left out, like the Mohenjo-daro Harappa civilization, the left out like Buddhism, the left out of the cultures of the working class, and the poorer peasantry. I think Baba Sahib Ambedkar would have gone to a great extent with that particular argument. Next one. Uh, Professor Gopal Guru comes from the Dalit community. Uh, we have a journal in India called Economic and Political Weekly, uh, probably the most important journal that comes out from India. He is currently the editor. He was uh, my colleague at the earlier university, we have done quite a bit of work together. And here he is arguing, is there a conception of the exemplar in Ambedkar? It's a very interesting argument. I have developed a critique of this argument in my introduction. But the argument itself is interesting because he says that Dalits almost universally in India have come to embrace Ambedkar as an exemplar. But Ambedkar himself thought <coughs> that the concept of exemplar is not good because it, it stunts your growth and, uh, and therefore uses this, uh, this idea of uh, um, idea that eventually if human growth has to be worked out, he says, Ambedkar argues you have to fall back upon your own, on your own feet. And the last lecture, yeah. Uh, the last lecture is by Homi K. Baba. Homi Baba is, uh, uh, is professor at the Harvard University. And this was the last lecture that he gave. And uh, when I was, his paper had not come, and therefore I had to constantly remind him to send the paper. Uh, and then he wanted to ask me, my comments on the paper. So there are a couple of places where I have tweaked in a little. But this, this paper is absolutely a masterpiece. 
it actually has an empirical side. The empirical side is the refugee problem and how no one wants the refugee. And uh, the refugee is someone who feels alienated in himself. And, uh, and therefore he begins to argue that the kind of ethical canons that we have with regard to human rights, they are not able to reach out to what he calls one-sixth of the humanity today. Uh, one-sixth of the humanity which has been displaced from their heart and home. And therefore we need to probably look into an alternative ethical principle. And he proposes that principle. You might agree with him or not agree, but he begins to argue that um, maybe your life is going to be my life tomorrow. And from that, an ethical principle begins to be proposed that, uh, that you need to treat the refugees like you would have treated yourself because you don't know whether it is going to be your condition tomorrow. You know, this particular argument, partly falling back upon the work of people like Arendt that he begins to construct. Samir, I don't know whether I have overstepped my limits. Not yeah, this. yeah. So I end with this, but just as a sort of an introduction, uh, Samir had read uh, this work and he, had, he sent me seven questions yesterday. And uh, I'm sure that Samir wants to introduce these questions and we can actually take these questions for discussion. But I have also noted down a short response to these questions as they come up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, well, that was a, a wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank you so much. Um, before I begin, though, um, and I'll, I, I'm not going to uh, go through all seven questions, but we'll try and compress some of them and, and uh, respond maybe a little bit more spontaneously um, to... Um, the presentation. Uh, before I begin, I, I would like to thank Paul uh, for that uh, outrageous uh, introduction. Um, I, I do want to go back, though, to the fact that um, not only am I an associate professor in the Department of Humanities, I'm also the director. And um, just listening to the presentation, it really um, reminds me uh, very much of how close um, uh, uh, Baba Saeed Ambedkar um, uh, in a sense uh, is, his legacy is to, uh, to our institute, our very modest institute, insofar as it is um, interdisciplinary and his, his scholarly output was thoroughly interdisciplinary. Um, he was uh, uh, engaged in uh, constitutionalism, producing uh, help uh, chairing the, the committee that drafted the Indian Constitution, of course, um, uh, contributing to to public policy, intervening in the public sphere. And I think this is this is really important. Um, the overarching concern uh, for him was, of course, social justice, and this is something that we we're very much concerned concerned with at uh, at, at the institute. Um, so I think that's that's a bit of the the frame. Um, one thing that we've been trying to do more and more of in the past few years, and will continue um, to do, um, continue to deepen in the future, is to try and forward um, a dialogue between uh, East and West. And, and this is why we, we especially value um, uh, Bjorn Bedkar's uh, um, uh, legacy, uh, because he is perched really at that, at that sort of um, border between uh, Eastern and Western traditions. Not the East and the West, but several different philosophical, um, religious, uh, and, and political traditions. And, and this to us is, is, is very interesting. Uh, we think that the, the way that humanities has been understood has been um, excessively blinkered insofar as it has just looked to the Western tradition. And I think this has um, now come under a lot of uh, uh, fire and uh, justifiably so. There's, there's been a, a really strong critique of Eurocentrism um, influenced by, amongst others, uh, uh, third wave feminism, um, 
post-colonial theory, which we'll come back to, India has made a, a very important contribution. Their Indian scholars, through the subaltern scholar uh, um, uh, group, has really made a, a very important contribution uh, to this post-structuralism, post-modernism. These are forms that, uh, of thinking that have really challenged uh, Eurocentrism and, and, and made us really think and rethink what, uh, what the, the future of the humanities um, ought, ought to look like. I think, though, in some ways, it um, might have also overshot its, its mark as well, insofar as you have these critiques of Eurocentrism which look a lot like the critique of um, Europe, the critique of the European legacy as such, as if it were unified. And it, it, it most certainly isn't. Um, Europe especially has been uh, profoundly marked by the cat catastrophe of the mid 20th century. Uh, and that has also um, influenced its subsequent unfolding and development, so in a much more critical sort of register. And, and I want to come back to that point. I, I think you, you might see um, the relevance of what I, I've been just saying in terms of some of the questions that I want to ask, because I think this is a, this is a really crucial idea. So I'll just start you know, with these, these wonderful essays, and, and your introduction is, is really brilliant, because they are quite different in their approaches, um, and you managed to synthesize them so, so brilliantly. Um, I, I should also say that we were extremely fortunate to have uh, a scholar of your stature here. We're really honored, and this well, is just a, a wonderful opportunity for us to have these kinds of, of, of discussions, so um, uh, we're, we're humbled and honored by, by your presence. Um, I, I want to take up this last couple of uh, contributions um, uh, from uh, Homi Baba uh, and uh, Romila Tarpur um, and, and think about this question of, of broken people. I think this is, this is really important because it resonates very much today, as Homi Baba is suggesting, in terms of the figure of the, of, of the refugee. Um, the refugee as a political figure and a subject is, is only going to um, gain in importance um, over time because of uh, um, various geopolitical, socioeconomic, and uh, ultimately uh, climate-related transformations that we've seen uh, over the past 20, 30 years, but, and we will, of course, see in, 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 in the future. Um, so I think this is really, uh, really key. It ties into some of the things that have been theorized already in, um, in terms of, well, even, even Hegel in the, in the 19th century was, was theorizing this idea of the rabble that were produced by modern society, a, sort of a, you know, the, 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 the mass that had really no place, no home within um, you know, bourgeois, liberal, um, uh, societies um, that couldn't fully be accommodated within them. Um, more recently, people like, uh, like the, the African scholar Akile uh, uh, Mbembe has spoken of the process by which um, there's a, a kind of what he calls becoming black of the world. And what he means by that is just as Africa and African societies have in a sense been um, or had been for, for, for centuries, um, either used as the repository of resources um, and, and human labor uh, at slaves, um, or had been completely forgotten. And he sees this as being very much the future of um, the neoliberal capitalist global order. Um, but also I think that there is especially, um, and I think this resonates for a number of reasons, um, and, and for reasons that Baba points out, um, there's the, the thinking of Hannah Arendt and the idea of the pariah. And I think this is really important, the pariah, and she's thinking about the, the Jewish community in Europe, particularly in, in, in Germany, as being the outsiders, as being the excluded, as being the, the, the downtrodden, the despised, um, you know, as, as you put it, the low, uh, the, the polluting, and the socially excluded. This is how uh, Ambedkar uh, sees uh, uh, the Dalits very much the, the position of, uh, of the Jews in, um, in Europe. And I think that when we start to overshoot our mark in terms of a critique of Europe, a critique of 
uh, of the concept of civilization, um, without attending to the difference within Europe, we, we risk something very great. And what do I mean by the difference within Europe? It was essentially, although not exclusively, the pariah peoples who saw European civilization as not simply civilized. You know, remember Gandhi's quip, you know, European civilization, it's a good idea. Yeah. You know, I'm, for, I'm all for it, you yeah. know. Um, so something that hasn't quite happened yet. Well, you had the, the Jewish Marxist thinker, Walter Benjamin, who said that there is no document of civilization that is not at the same time a document of barbarism. So you see what I'm saying, that there is already within Europe an understanding of European civilization as itself marked by violence and exclusion, right? And very much um, that violence and exclusion certainly applied to Europe, but where did it have its roots? In the various imperial projects. So there's already a self-consciousness of the violence of European civilization. So it's not simply a matter of a, an innocent concept that can be anthropologically applied to different parts of the world in this and of orientalizing gaze, right? So my, here, the, the first question then, uh, there's a, a, a big kind of lead up, but the, 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 the first question is, is there not a danger in too great uh, or uh, too overreaching, overarching a rejection of Europe? Because Europe often comes to be shorthand for things like universalism, human rights, um, uh, 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 contractualism and a, and, and, a, and a theory of justice. Um, because you see within Europe a rejection of these things and also of course within the Indian context, um, in the context of uh, an ascendant BJP, you have a very similar kind of resonance. You know, these, these are not our traditions. We can play fast and loose with them. Constitutionalism. So, there is this other side which, which, which is deeply troubling. At least I, I from, from the outside, find this, uh, this troubling. What are your thoughts about this? The potential dangers of an all too quick rejection of certain aspects of the European tradition? Yeah. Uh, my quick responses, because uh, the issue that, that you have raised is something which is central central to scholarship, central to also our concerns today. And um, uh, I just want to give, a, you know, propose a twofold response. The first is in the book. In the book, the question that you have raised centrally comes in, in the work of Vinandas. Homi Baba, of course, raises this in terms of the refugee and argues that if the refugees are put together, they would be one sixth of humanity today. Uh, and uh, he builds up this case of uh, the dead bodies swimming in the sea in off the Tunisia coast in Zazis, and nobody is prepared to pick them up. And uh, Tunisia is largely a Muslim country and you need to bury the dead, but very often you don't bury the dead, but pile them up or throw them in the sea. And he takes this up as a case study and comes across this interesting Red Cross worker. And he begins to pick this up from probably from the deep traditions mm. and begin to say, who knows, tomorrow, you know, Tomorrow I might be in that position, yeah. you might be, and therefore begins to talk about an ethical norm that comes up from this of ethical alterity, Homi Baba calls mm. it, you know, partly using uh, the work of... Uh, mm, Levinas? Yeah, yeah. 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 Uh, now, uh, so there is, this is first, that the book uh, the, in the book, this issue, I think, comes up quite centrally, in, at least in two, three major works. I would probably put Ashish Nandi even there, a little, uh, but only marginally. Mm. Uh, but let me say what I would like to say on this question. You know? 
I mode means how would probably Dr. Ambedkar would have approached this particular question. Uh, now, um, as I mentioned earlier, Dr. Ambedkar may not have used the term Dalit as a, as a universal evocation of a particular social constituency very often. But the concept is already present in Ambedkar that there are people in India uh, of huge numbers which civilization as a whole has treated them as broken people. Now, here I want to bring in a little of uh, Dewey. You know? Ambedkar, together with Dewey, rejects any kind of uh, essentialism and begin to argue that human beings constitute themselves through their social relations. So human beings become human beings through the kind of access to social relations they have, and untouchability for Ambedkar becomes a phenomenon where there is a social closure where the potentiality is not allowed to unfold itself. Now from this I want to push a little and begin to argue that for Ambedkar, unlike for probably for Marxism, the reconstitution of the self can come about only by reconstituting the society. And the reconstitution of society can come about from the worst point of denial of selfhood. So in several ways, Ambedkar sees Dalits as the vanguard of the recreation of the world of the future because in their own personhood, they experience what could be the worst <laughs> for the human. There are three essays that Ambedkar wrote comparing situation of the untouchables with that of the Jews. And um, Ambedkar, Ambedkar, of course Jews today are fairly powerful people in the world, but Ambedkar's Jews are the Jews of Karl Marx in the Jewish question. While for Marx, the, the liberal revolution proposes an answer to the Jewish question by creating the citizen subject. Ambedkar is not very easy with that. But Ambedkar thought that the Jews had an internal strength with them. Although they were excluded, they had an internal strength which Dalits have been denied. And therefore, he thinks that while the Jews also have been marginalized, the marginality of the Dalit is, is something which is qualitatively different. Mm. He, he has this, three, you know, he compares the slaves. He compares the Brazilian slaves with the American slaves. And, but then begins to say that, and then, you know, covers the period of the Roman Empire and the way slaves were treated in the Roman Empire. He gives an example of historiography that, okay, let me go back because in the past people were treated worsely. Let me take up the Roman question. And begins to say that in Rome, a, a slave who could prove himself able and of worth, he could actually occupy positions without giving up his own entitlement as a slave. But Dalits do not have that option. And then goes into the, goes into the history of the way slaves have been treated. Of course, I'm sure that there could be alternative accounts treated in the United States and said their humanity was not fully curbed. 
and begins to talk about relationship between the head of the the lady head of the family and the slaves which is not possible in india because mm. yeah so there is this very interesting comparisons mm. that he begins to work out in terms of global marginalities and the kind of marginalities that comes to be worked out mm. in india yeah and probably pitching himself to a situation that if dalits have to take on they have to take on the whole world mm. uh, and last uh, very quick uh, comment see it's quite interesting that uh, that uh, ambedkar picks up ambedkar is one of the most cosmopolitan scholar that we have from the global south um, uh, cosmopolitan in the sense someone who is exposed probably to the best of education that the transatlantic world could offer but ambedkar picks up from the margins ambedkar picks up john dewey you know rather than the iconic intellectuals of the period john dewey to a great extent is a rebel mm. john dewey also has a very different notion of democracy john dewey argues very strongly that the means of production have to be redistributed you cannot actually begin you cannot think of the future of humanity the way means of production are concentrated in a few hands john dewey works with several others with the slave movement with the labor movement in new york and in chicago and particularly with the suffrage movement of women Hmm. so ambedkar comes from a kind of oppositional strand and similarly with the fabians hmm. okay. uh so well if i could if i yeah, could just yeah, um yeah, uh, respond yeah. i think uh i would have to disagree somewhat in terms of how you've described um uh ambedkar's view for example of uh social relations constituting the 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 the, the self or the subject um as as in fact being very close to uh at least some i think no i think marxism as such marx um views uh the individual as on a, as he put it an ensemble of social relations um the idea uh of of dewey's of um redistribu- re- redistributing uh the the ownership and control of the means of production is also uh, very very close to to marx um so i i think this is quite interesting this uh on the one hand um close proximity that that uh, um uh, i discern to uh, uh to the marxist tradition yet um uh, tremendous ambivalence to the politics of marxism it seems in in ambedkar which yeah, might explain absolutely. also absolutely. um the uh the the relationship between um contemporary uh ambedkarites um and the dalit movement uh, more generally i take the, the this interesting opposition between um the kind of rebellious uh, dalits uh on the one hand uh and then the ambedkarites who who distance themselves from that kind of political stance and it's very interesting um but there is definitely a a, a real tension between uh, uh the dalit movement various political representatives of of that movement um and uh the communists in 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 india um could you talk a little bit more about this i mean i i think when we were discussing this yesterday it 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 seems that there there is something of a um of of a chasm here um which i think at at one level is um is surprising but at another level it isn't because we're today having discussions about the uh comparative importance of class versus gender versus race versus sexual orientation and so on and there are those sort of more hardline marxists who say that class is 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 preeminent um it is the fundamental um uh organizing 
principle of, of domination in capitalist societies. And then there are those who make more sort of intersectional arguments that one has to look at the um, uh, imb imbrication or the relationship between all these different um, forms of, of domination and how they, how they interact. So this is very much of an alive, uh, a, a live kind of discussion today in, in the West. So perhaps you could uh, yeah. say a few things about that. Yeah. Um, again, following back on, you know, I would first I would fall back and then come to my own little experience about how to handle these questions. Uh, Ambedkar thinks, and this is a point that he makes in Annihilation of Caste, Ambedkar thinks that there are multiple sites of uh, oppression. Um, and uh, any attempt to, any attempt to formally tend to be reductive in terms of the idea of class would eventually result in not making the class itself. Because if the, even if the class is made, the class is going to be so full of cleavages from within that it would not be able to sustain itself. So he begins to ask the question to the communists, for instance, or to socialists in annihilation of caste, saying that how are you going to work out the notion of class when people are, people are not prepared to move beyond caste. So Ambedkar thinks that there are multiple sides of oppression that uh, one can prioritize, one can contextually prioritize, but you cannot ignore. Mm. This is the first big argument. The second, Ambedkar works with the communists for during, uh, uh, particularly during these two years from 1937 to 1939. Uh, he works with Dange, the great leader of the working class uh, in, uh, during this period in Bombay, but soon begins to find, soon begin to be deeply disenchanted with the way communists were going around because they were universally declaring a set of people as workers and in the process taking up leadership over them. And if you look at closely at the constitution of this class, Dalits would be at the rock bottom. Mm. Say for, in, for instance, the big labor force in Bombay till very recently, till 1980s, was the textile labor. Within textile industry, Dalits could not work where, you know, where stitching was involved, where sewing was involved, because very often the person would put in the mouth and that would be polluting and uh, Ambedkar asked the question, if you want to organize workers, is it not necessary that the working class be introspect, particularly where there are multiple cleavages, introspect and begin to develop a struggle from within? This is the first. The second one, Ambedkar thought, that communist movement in India was reproducing the class division, the caste division that was prevalent in India. The upper caste, particularly Brahmins, would invariably become the leaders of the movement. While they would not openly tell the others that you cannot become leaders, but they had certain capacities, certain talents, in, invariably they would become the leaders. So unlike the Brahmins, they may not have said, you have no entry, but effectively, yeah. in terms of the quotidian practices, the Brahmin would always be on the top. Yeah. So unspoken and forms yes, of exclusion. And if not Brahmins, the upper caste. Yeah. Communist parties in India have not been adequately reflective about their own inner life. 
Suppose I take up a Leninist phrase, they have not been sufficiently self-critical. You know, right. they have been critical but not self-critical. Mm. As a collective, which is going to lead the movement. Well, I mean, one can say that um, uh, Leninism itself, yeah. the theory and yeah, practice yeah, of yeah, Leninism, yeah, does yeah, 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 lead yeah. to a kind of caste organization. Yeah, yeah that's right. right. This is that's a right. small uh, professional revolutionary organization becomes a kind of caste unto itself. Mm. So you, you need uh, not just Leninist self-criticism, yeah, but somebody like I agree. Rosa Luxemburg. No, no, I, I'm the, not. I'm not party. defending Lenin here. Yeah, but yeah, yeah I'm no. Just, but this is yeah, a discussion uh, that can just be just a phrase that. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we're used to seeing um, massive labor mobilization in India, general strikes. I mean, about three years ago, there was massive. I think one of the largest general strikes in all of Indian history. I mean, uh, millions of, of, of workers are, are, are mobilized. Um, what kind of participation do you see uh, amongst Dalit workers there? Are they often uh, um, mobilized in, in, in great numbers or, or not? Mm -hmm. If you look at the last uh, India went to liberalization in the early 90s. Now India has about 25 years of what we call the policy of liberalization. Therefore, the organized workforce in India has come down enormously. Uh, today you have about 97% of the entire workforce in India in, in the informal sector. Wow. And the informal Dalits have had very little entry into the private sector. Uh, in the organized private sector, there is only 1.3% Dalits in India. This is Ashwini Deshpande's uh, you know, grammar of caste. Mm -hmm. you know? uh, now, there has been an argument that has been made by people like Professor Thorat that there should be reservation in the private sector. But the but the corporate sector in India has very strongly resisted any kind of intervention with regard to hiring Dalit labor. So they basically are within the informal sector. Uh, and they have taken up leadership. But Dalits are a big constituency in India. Uh, Dalits have taken up the state in India. But there are some very important leaders like Jignesh Mewani uh, from Gujarat, yeah. who comes from the radical left traditions. In fact, he, he was close to the CPIM. So one of the arguments that he has made, and there is a great deal of <coughs> reception to that argument, that the future that India wants to think about needs to bring in the class question alongside the caste question. Uh, now, how it is going to, going to work itself out in terms of nitty gritties and practices, because the land question is quite important in India. And most of the Dalits in India are landless laborers. Uh, while uh, the indigenous population in India at least has some land to fall back upon, uh, Dalit laboring masses are very, very, you know, very scanty. Uh, the last NSSO, that is National uh, Statistical Survey that I read, 54% of the entire landless labor in India today is, um, uh, no, 50, no, the landless labor in India is increasingly becoming feminine as men folk are moving into non-agricultural occupations, and 54% of them are scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. So you have today a kind of, suppose I use this word, overdetermined kind of a class formation in India, where at the rock bottom is Dalit and uh, Adivasi labor, and therefore, in a sense, reproducing the traditional divisions. Uh, well, there are new sensitivities like the Mewani kind that I just suggested. Mm. 
while the communists could have done this, you yeah. know, but the communists at the height, when I did my one empirical study on BD labor in the 1980s, I collected this large amount of data with regard to the organization of landless labor, and uh, the CITU office told me that they have only 1.5% of their membership drawn from landless labor. And one of the reasons that the communists did not find an entry into this sprawling you know, constituency mm. of landless labor is the problem of untouchability. Communists did not understand the problem of untouchability. Yeah. And therefore, when they raised the land question, they raised the land question as redistribution of land, land and not the question of you know, the practices of untouchability yeah. in, the rural, in the rural areas. Thank you so much. Uh, we have about 15 minutes. Um, I'll just now uh, take questions, comments uh, from the audience. Yeah, comments are more welcome than questions. Hello, sir. Yeah. My English is not very good. Can I like to speak for the video? No, in Hindi, I speak. जब हम अशुद्ध की बात पढ़ते हैं, अंतर्चवर्ती की बात पढ़ते हैं, इसमें धर्म का कंसेप्ट है। सबसे पहले आपको गीता को पढ़नी चाहिए। गीता के 18 चैप्टर हैं, 8 चैप्टर पे में जाइए उसमें 11 अलावन शुरू का है, उसमें कहता है को हमालिया एंड श्रीलंका की बात कहते हैं। हिंदू धर्म को एक ऐसी दशा का पता है, जो उसका 18 चैप्टर है 41, 44, 43, 44, 45, उसमें आता है चत्रवन, चत्रवन में चार जाते, उसमें आता है ब्रह्मन, कुशत्रि वैश्यन शूद्र जो ब्राह्मण है पूजाधारी है जो वेद शास्त्र पढ़ता है दूसरों को शिक्षा देता है जो क्षत्र है वो आर्मी मैन है जो मिलिट्री मैन है जो देश की रक्षा करते हैं दे लाइक टू टू हाई कास्ट उसमें तीसरी आती है वैश्य जो हल चलाने का काम करता है जो चौथा है वो है शूद्र शूद्र है चूड़ा एंड चुमार जो चूड़ा है अभी इंडिया में वो टॉयलेट साफ करता है, जो चुमार है वो चमड़े का काम करता है, उसके आगे हता है इत्शुद्रा, इत्शुद्रा में इन बोमेन, बोमेन का फिफ्थ दर्जा है। जब आप कास्टिस्ट के वे बारे पढ़ते हैं डॉक्टर मिडकर पर हमने बोमेन राइट के लिए बहुत लिखा है, तो जब कास्टिस्ट की बात पढ़ते ह� ने उसने बहुत किताबें लिखी है बुद्धा एंड धम्मा लिखा है उसने कहा कि मैं हिंदू धर्म में बोर्न हुआ मैं हिंदू मरूंगा नहीं उसने 14 अक्टूबर 1956 में नागपुर में बुद्ध दीक्षा ली उस समय में जी लिखा कि जब पांच लाख लोग हैं तो बहुत सारे मेरे पास आर्टिकल है वो चार लाख से ज्यादा नहीं जाते सवाल चीज ये पैदा होती है डॉक्टर अंबेडकर क्यों गया डॉक्टर अंबेडकर ने जब स्टडी की तो कोलंबिया यूनिवर्सिटी न्यूयॉर्क में की उसने किताब लिखी थी एनेशन कास्ट एनेशन कास्ट का जात बात का बीज ना है उसने दो बातें कही वो कहता तब दूर हो सकती जब एंटर डाइन जब हम बैठ के खाते हैं एंटर मैरी जब हम एक दूसरे से शादी करते हैं जो इंडिया का सिस्टम है वो पृथ्वी पृथ्वी है जैसे हम चमार कास्ट में पैदा हुए मेरे पिताजी चमड़े का काम करते थे तो हमारा जो घर है वो नॉर्थ दिशा में है इंडिया के किसी गांव में जाएंगे जितने में साउथ के घर हैं, तो सब जे देलाई टू शूट का सेंट बैकवर्ड, छुटी जाती के लोग हैं। तो मैंने पूछा कि हमारा घर इस तरफ में क्या है? वो कहते जे जहाँ की ज़मीन अच्छी थी, तो उन्होंने कहा कि जहाँ पर हेतला लाका है, जे ले लो, जहाँ पर हैं। 
तो जब हम स्कूल में पढ़ने जाते थे तो मेरा नाम सीताराम है तो मेरे को कहते हैं आर यू ब्राह्मण मेरे को ये पता मैं ब्राह्मण नहीं मैं क्या मेरे को तो पता नहीं मैं क्या हूँ तो मैं घर आके पूछा कि हम कौन हैं तो वो कहते हैं आपको पता नहीं है हम तो चुमार हैं तो दूसरे दिन तीसरे दिन पता कि मैं नहीं चुमार हैं तो उसने मेरे से अलग बातें की जब मैं डी वी हाई स्कूल नकोदर में गया उसमें जहाँ से मैट्रिक की तो जहाँ पर दो टीचर थे तो एक था ड्र डॉक्टर सॉरी मिस्टर लक्ष्मदास ड्राइंग मास्टर था वो हमारे से बड़ा प्रेम करता था तो मैं ड्राइंग में बड़ा अच्छा था तो हम जो देखते थे क्या है तो उस समय डॉक्टर अम्बेडकर का लड़का जसवंत राव हमारे नकोदर में आया उसकी हमने फोटोग्राफी की तो उस समय में दो लगी थी तो जहाँ पर पाँच लोग गए सारे स्कूलों को छुट्टी हुई मेरे को बड़ा दुख हुआ अभी क्या बात है डॉक्टर अम्बेडकर पर बात हुई है उसका लड़का है तो ये लोग क्यों नहीं आए लोगों को उस समय में समझ नहीं थी जो जितना जात का प्रेशर है उस समय में आदमी उतना है डॉक्टर अम्बेडकर ने जो स्टडी की तो जो रिजर्वेशन की बात आई तो महात्मा गांधी ने मनवत रखा आप कभी जरदा जेल में जाकर देखिए ग्यारह फ्लोरी मंजिल है उसका जो टेम्पल है वहाँ से जो फुलकारी होती है फूलों के बस जा कर रखा उसके जूते रखे हुए हैं जेल पर वहाँ उसको लोग सलाम करते हैं ये बात देखने वाली ये बात देखने वाली ये बात देखने वाली जी ठीक है तो जितना डिबेट गांधी और अम्बेडकर पर है तो जो इंडिया का निशान है उस पर तीन शेरों के निशान है जब आप बनारस में जाएँ तो बनारस के साथ सारनाथ है तो वहाँ पर चौदह फुट का स्टैचू है तो जब इंडिया का कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन बना उसने ये स्टैंप लगाई सभी लोगों को लगाई आपकी जो सरकार ही है उसको निकाल पा नोटों पर महात्मा गांधी ला दी है महात्मा गांधी का रोल क्या था जितनी डिबेट डॉक्टर अम्बेडकर ने गांधी पर की नो नो ओ ओके एक से आई एम फिनिश ओके ओ ओके आई एम फिनिश तो ये हम ये ये हम ये बात करना चाहते हैं तो कहाँ अम्बेडकर कहाँ गांधी कहाँ दलित तो जब तक कास्ट सिस्टम के बात नहीं करेंगे तब तक ये बात नहीं बनेगी थैंक यू वेरी मच अगर कोई गलती हो तो क्षमा करना नो एक्चुअली ही रेज्ड फोर इश्यूज ही सेड द फर्स्ट वन इज इट इज इंपॉर्टेंट टू लुक इन टू द गीता भगवत गीता दैट इज द मोस्ट सेक्रेट टेक्स्ट इन इंडिया Uh, Ambedkar wrote on the Gita a commentary, wherein he begins to say the Gita might be calling forth for an ethic of selfless action, anashakti, but um, but actually defends the four varnas, Brahmins, Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Shudras. Um, he was not connecting it, but Ambedkar has this very powerful piece. The second thing he raised was Ambedkar's rejection of Hinduism, and all all of us know this here. The third thing is Ambedkar's uh, diksha to Buddhism, uh, and why he went to Buddhism. And fourth one, he raised his own personal account that he came from a particular caste called Chamar. which is an untouchable caste as soon as his classmates came to know about his caste how they began to distance themselves and what eventually made him to be committed to a kind of photographic profession you know um, uh, representing ambedkar and ambedkar sides in photography Uh, you know with that particular kind of experiences that he himself suffered so these four big issues that he raised yeah so um yeah, yeah if we could we have, have a couple more questions but really try to keep them concise. keep them concise and brief yeah yeah i think it is important to keep it yes uh, precise Absolutely. yes chin please chin banerji yeah. as you pointed out as you pointed out as you pointed out dr ambedkar is now universally acclaimed though till some years ago there was a generally understood attempt to ignore him <coughs> or to not mention him 
Uh, now everybody acknowledges Dr. Ambedkar. But this seems to be a, leading to a certain kind of a problem in that while a certain amount of, a, a certain strain of extremely oppressive politics <coughs> is also paying homage to Dr. Ambedkar. Dr. Ambedkar, of course, also continues to be the hero and inspiration of a revolutionary struggle. Yeah. So we are looking at a gamut of political uses of Dr. Ambedkar. This has not happened recently. I mean, the case of Dr. Ambedkar's acceptance, I think, even among uh, Dalits, from, from what I understand, has been a slow process. He was not always acclaimed and approved and accepted, but gradually his stature was established and people have found it convenient to accept him. But the point of his universal acceptance now is that there's a whole political spectrum from ultra right wing to, uh, to the left uh, that is now Ambedkar. Yeah. Right? Yeah. This out, right? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Rohit Venula is an Ambedkarite, and so are the people who lead him to hang himself and force him yeah. to hang himself. Yeah. What do you have to say about that? Uh, a quick response, a very quick response. I agree with, uh, with um, the trajectory that Ambedkar has come to spawn today, the, the social constituency that, and that has taken place, of course, uh, not suddenly. Uh, today, by far, probably, if you ask who is the greatest uh, leader of India in the 20th century, the number is likely to go in favor of uh, Ambedkar, uh, like the survey that Outlook magazine carried out uh, a year ago when they asked who is the most important leader of the 20th century India, Ambedkar was hands down, you know, hands up, you know, the biggest leader. Partly because I think Ambedkar begins to talk to several deeply felt dimension. Sometimes we may not be able to verbalize it, like the idea of respect, the idea of human dignity. We are not talking the big issues of rights, but we are talking about being treated as a human. You know? And this takes place in terms of quotidian practices. Uh, one of my friends, uh, Javed uh, Alam, wrote a book called uh, uh, who wants democracy in India? And in this book, he begins to argue that uh, uh, all people in India rally behind democracy, although democracy might have done very little for them in terms of enablement. But democracy has done one thing to them. That is, they can actually begin to say that I am as big as you. You know, the long digger slogan in uh, you know, in uh, Britain in the 17th century, that I'm as good a human being, I'm as big a human being as you are. And this is democracy has done. Now, why, why Ambedkar begins to be, begin to be, depict, Ambedkar has become today the saint for everyone, you know. Everybody wants to latch on to Ambedkar from the extreme right, to the extreme left. In fact, this book is published by a press along with Ambedkar University, which is a left-leaning press. You know, and uh, they grabbed it. They wanted to make their statement. Uh, and, uh, hmm. yeah, uh, and they thought that this book is a very important site for them to make the statement. And my university was in favor of it. You know, I, I did not have uh, much choice to make, but even if I was to make a choice, I think I would have gone with that particular choice. But why? Now, because there is the kind of appropriation that is taking place of Ambedkar by rereading his writings 
in favor of their own ideologies and positions. It's not a simple appropriation of naming that Ambedkar is part of our icon, but by redrafting and reinterpreting Ambedkar, particularly Ambedkar's works on nationalism, uh, Ambedkar's work on religion. Uh, so there is a lot of rereading that is taking place because Ambedkar spawns a large constituency. 17% uh, Dalits, but as I mentioned earlier, a much larger constituency, mm. which probably thinks that Ambedkar resonates their own cherished values about how humans mm. should treat humans. Yeah. I think we have yeah. maybe a final question. I think it was very wonderful, like, uh, a talk by you, a great and a very diverse understanding on Ambedkar. Now, my coming from psychology and philosophy, I have a very theoretical kind of a question. And that is how, uh, so there, there is John Rawls talking about justice, and then there is Nozick talking about libertarian and another other side. Um, and then you have Ambedkar, who's also arguing some points and certain perspectives. So there are three elements at play, self, society, and uh, the state. And all these three elements need to be reconstituted. Now, Ambedkar having a constitutional background and the Buddhist principles also take a lot of I mean, uh, character in terms of his articulation. How do you see how Nozick uh, approaches the libertarian and Rawls approaches self, uh, state, and society? And how is uh, Ambedkar going way different from them? <coughs> yeah. One of, the, one of the early questions, sorry about stepping in so fast. One of the early questions that Professor Bhikkhu Parikh, the first person who wrote this essay was asking, why should an Englishman produce the work on social justice, which has become so decisive? Why didn't someone work a kind of a grand mapping of social justice like the way John Rawls has done. Now, uh, there are today various interpretations of John Rawls, um, but one thing is absolutely no doubt that there is a very strong egalitarian argument that John Rawls proposes, which to some extent rhymes with some of the positions that Ambedkar takes. Uh, Rawls also argues that uh, equal liberties would mean that people should not actually have ownership over means of production because that would deeply compromise on equal liberties. Ambedkar also very strongly argues for a particular position. But somebody like Rawls comes from a sort of a philosophizing, philosophizing tradition while Ambedkar comes from a very different kind of a tradition, but gets into policy making. Not that policy is disconnected with philosophical positions, but philosophical positions remain used concepts rather than like the way John Rawls does, a reflective kind of theory making. You know, what he calls the reflective equilibrium. Now, Ambedkar would have definitely disagreed with the positions that Robert Nozick would take because Nozick argues for, for a kind of fundamentalism of the market. Ambedkar strongly argued that market has to be regulated. Ambedkar upheld the notion of class, upheld the notion of class struggle, and eventually thought that a equal society cannot coexist with the kind of uh, concentration of resources worldwide. So I think there is, there is a certain thaw in the position that Rawls would take, and, uh, and uh, definitely a very strong opposition to the position that somebody like Robert Nozick would take. But I think we need to look into the frame that they come from. You know? 
Ambedkar is primarily into working out you know, domains of argumentation, you know, constitutional application of concepts, uh, rather than the kind of reflective frame that Rawls adopts in terms of constructing concepts. Yeah. Okay. All right, we, uh, we're going to have to wrap up. Could you speak to you? Yes, yeah. We're going to have to wrap up now. Um, so I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to uh, thank both of you for a very interesting conversation this evening that actually plumbed great depths and considerable detail. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you all for coming. I'd like to just say one final word, which is um, President Andrew Petter is going to be hosting um, the final lecture of Professor Rodriguez on April the 15th. We had, we had it up on the screen for probably 15 minutes, so hopefully you saw the details, but it will be circulated through social media and on our websites here at SFU, so you'll know about it. But you are all welcome to attend. There will be a reception following the, the lecture, so um, by all means, do come out. And thank you, thank you again for coming. <laughs>